oh, I think as time goes on, we're going to get see fatigue setting in, people getting tired of these restrictions, and especially people who feel like they're unaffected wanting to get on with their lives. I mean, the things infectious disease outbreak show is how we're all tied together. You can have 95% of people comply, but the 5% who don't can set everything back for that 95%. What you do affects me, what I do infect you, and that's classic infectious diseases. Um, in terms of how it pans out, you know, I would agree with many of those comments. I kind of would put forward three best case situations and then possibly a worst case. And the best case would be the virus mutates into a form that's perhaps more infectious, but um, less um, less deadly, less, has less side effects, more innocuous. So more like one of the common cold coronaviruses. That would be tremendous if that happened, because that would mean that we wouldn't have the health impacts that these the SARS-CoV-2 seems to give. The second would be that there's broader immunity, T cell immunity than we think. The antibody surveys have been remarkably disappointing that most countries are coming in under 10%. If there was something, a better kind of test to say that actually could more people than we think be exposed or have cross immunity from other viruses, that would be great as well. But again, both of those are uncertain. And the third would be that there's a vaccine. There's several promising ones that come through in the next few months. And then you'd have something to really convince, you know, the public to comply, say, hold on with these measures, comply with these measures for a bit longer because there's a vaccine coming and that could be a game changer, especially if it has very few side effects and is ineffective in terms of lasting immunity for a year or two. But I also think we can't guarantee any of those. And we're going into a winter. This virus seems to like cold, indoor conditions, damp conditions. And I think then all countries can do is try to control super spreading events, go after clusters, and just kind of keep trying to drive the virus out so you can keep your economy going and society going and get schools open. I think in the two-year frank time work, let's say we get to the spring and we've had a really bad winter. A lot of people have died. We've gotten to another lockdown. You might see countries that can starting to eliminate this virus, similar to what New Zealand, Taiwan, Vietnam, um, Thailand have done and just said, actually, we don't want to live with it. We'll put in place COVID checks on our borders. We'll put in place testing and quarantine procedures so we can catch the virus so we can get, you know, and what you might see in a very kind of surreal take is that you have a COVID free world, the countries that can clear it and can have border checks and robust testing will have it. And the countries that can't probably generally low resource countries are going to struggle and then hopefully can come and help. And that would be, for example, if you don't have lasting immunity. Um, which we don't know yet, and that you could have repeated waves of this virus rather than any kind of static position. So I think there's a whole range of scenarios, and I think I just try to kind of lay them out of what what are the uncertainties, the scenarios, and as we get more information, we can start to narrow the number of scenarios that are out there from best case to worst case. 